and we wanted to better understand what are the real drivers and it's not to to mention only the pure inequality of income and and wealth but it goes beyond and robert gold has started to uh, to do a lot of huge research on on this a uh, couple of years ago and for us also and now he has um, prepared a paper on the economics of populism and the idea was to 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 try and have a first idea of what can help against uh, populism given that one of the main drivers seems to be economic social economic and so what can help against it i will introduce the panel we are all uh, on online already um after the input so i will ask robert to introduce uh, your thoughts on this question please yeah thanks a lot uh, thomas for the kind introduction and the invitation it really feels good to present in front of real people again um, yeah, my task has been to review the literature on the causes of populism again to uh, infer some policy implications. And if you look at this literature, um, you can roughly group uh, the research into two categories. There's a lot of papers who deal with the, what I would just call very broadly cultural roots of uh, populism. So norms, values, beliefs, identity. Um, that uh, make um, people support populist agenda. And another uh, strand of research is more concentrated on the economic roots. And while the literature on the cultural roots very nicely explains level differences, so why is it that populists are more successful in some countries than in others? And why is it that uh, some regions um, ben, uh, support populism, populists more than others. Why is it that regions in Germany that uh, were already very supportive of the Nazi party are nowadays the same regions that support um, 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 uh, populist uh, parties? Why is it that angry white men uh, are so susceptible to uh, populism? This is all very well explained by this set of literature. Um, my understanding is that the literature that looks, looks at the economic roots is better equipped to explain the recent rise of populism that we have seen over the last decade or so. And this is one reason why I want to focus on this uh, set of literature, specifically also because it provides more opportunities for policy interventions, right? So if you want to address the cultural roots of populism, this would require societal change and a change in norms and beliefs. And it's not easy to to uh, really come up with concrete policy suggestions here. And you might even ask whether uh, it is, um, whether government should interfere with, uh, with uh, societal change in that way. But I think we can, um, from the literature on the economic routes, uh, derive some more straightforward policy conclusions on what to do here. This does not mean that economic roots and cultural roots are independent of each other. Uh, they interrelate specifically since the supply side. So the populist campaigning is very successful in, in linking these topics, in linking economic hardship to anxieties about the future, to xenophobia and so on and so forth. Um, my understanding here is that economic developments provide the ground for this populist agenda to succeed. And um, yeah, having said this, this is my view on the thing. And this is why I want to concentrate on the economic roots of populism. Let's have a quick look at the background. I want to focus on uh, European countries. I want to focus on far right populism, uh, just because this is the dominant um, yeah, the, the, the dominant uh, development in Europe, we see specifically a rise of far, uh, far right parties and right wing populist parties, not so much uh, on the left. And this map shows you results of the European parliamentary, uh, parliamentary election in 1999 uh, and the regional share of uh, the regional vote shares populist parties gained there. You see this is before the East Ward uh, enlargement. And when we now click through it from European election to European election, you see how populist support spreads across uh, the countries. Um, you also see how 
the average uh, increases. And if we look uh, at uh, just the change between the 2009 and 2019 elections, you see that uh, populist um, parties have been active in all, uh, all uh, the countries. This was not the, the thing at the start, but, but populism spread across Europe. You have now uh, populist parties on the ballots in each and every European country and they have gained significant support to percentage points on average, which is an increase of 100% over 10 years. But you also see these strong regional heterogeneities. You see country level heterogeneities, which may um, relate to cultural issues. And yeah, you don't see this that nicely on this map, I have to agree, but you also see huge regional variation within countries. So even countries like Germany, where um, a populist support may be comparatively low as compared to, for instance, uh, France or uh, Austria, you uh, still, uh, still see that there are regional strongholds uh, of populism that uh, emerged. And I want to come back to that. But this is the background. This is the development we want to uh, better understand. Uh, we want to understand what drives this development, not so much the level differences, but the dynamics over time. And here I tried to uh, quickly and roughly summarize uh, the literature uh, uh, results. So the broad picture is somewhat trivial perhaps that, that macroeconomic developments induce structural change in all countries, what we focus here on industrial countries that increase inequalities, not only income inequalities, but inequalities in uh, chances and the development perspectives. And this provides the voting potential for populist parties. Actually, it generates a voting potential for parties that offer protection against these uh, macroeconomic shocks. It has to do a lot with the supply side, with the populist campaigning that it's actually populist to tap into this potential. But, um, and actually many, you, uh, many studies in, in economics do not clearly differentiate between far right parties and extremist parties and populist parties, um, which has disadvantages, but in the very end, uh, I think is reasonable giving that um, the economics behind and the dynamics behind is one that increases uh, voting potential for a specific set uh, of, of uh, policies. In the end, uh, the subset of voting for the, the, the voting potential for, for extremist parties is a subset of this voting potential for populist parties. Um, having said this, yeah, this is the, the, the general trend. And what, uh, what, 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 um, research has more closely looked into over the recent um, decade or so is uh, specifically economic developments that relate to globalization and uh, technological change. We have papers on financial globalization, very much focused on effects of the financial crisis, which is of course a little bit uh, specific. We have papers on trade integration, very much focused on the rise of China. We have papers on technological change, very much focused on automation and digitalization. <clears throat> Sorry. And we have papers on international migration with a strong focus on the effect of a refugee crisis, which is, of course, also uh, kind of uh, specific. And of course, all these shocks interrelate. Um, for, for, for trade globalization, uh, uh, you need to also have financial globalization to, to um, to, to finance uh, trade and uh, you need technological change to facilitate uh, this and uh, in the trade affected regions, you then have investment into labor saving technology to to um, to cope with uh, with with uh, competition from from uh, from uh, low wage countries. Um, I'll, I'll try to separate uh, things where it's where it's uh, where it's where it's necessary. Otherwise, I'll treat this all more or less like like a big economic shocks. And these these shocks induce structural change in industrialized countries. Um, the, the big secular trends are deindustrialization and the growth of the service sector. You have uh, automation that also puts pressure on specifically manufacturing jobs. And you have a trend 
and that is uh, specifically relevant if you look at regional inequalities of urbanization that relates to this. And sorry. In principle, this whole, whole process of macroeconomic development and of structural change is an ever ongoing process. This has been there since the Industrial Revolution, but which is a little bit different perhaps since the recent wave of globalization is not only that, that, um, that the dynamics accelerated, it is also that uh, the inequalities um, that, that, that emerged became more polarized in many dimensions. So you have a decline of manufacturing in, um, in, in, in industrialized countries. On the other hand, you have a growth of service jobs, but those service jobs emerge not in the same regions where the manufacturing took place before. Those service jobs emerge in cities and, and, um, and, and, um, and uh, contribute to the strength of uh, urbanization and to a certain degree, some of these inequalities that uh, result from structural change reinforce and become increasingly difficult to bridge. Um, the inequalities, obviously, because otherwise they would not be called uh, inequalities, uh, generate winners and uh, losers. And uh, there's increasing overlap. Uh, on the individual level, a lot depends on the skill level. So it's specifically medium and low skilled individuals that are negatively affected by deindustrialization and by automation. Um, similar on the regional level, there are former uh, manufacturing regions that lose out due to trade integration and um, that uh, lose out due to uh, technological change and that see in selective out migration of skilled individuals to uh, the urban centers, which, which uh, further, further uh, hampers the development uh, perspectives of uh, these regions. And this is more or less the, 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 the basic uh, picture of how economic shocks translate into the voting potential for far-right parties. The question is, um, does this provide opportunities for economic policy? And I want to focus on economic policy to tackle populism. Well, first and foremost, of course, welfare policies may help to cushion adverse impacts of economic shocks. This is true in general, but perhaps it's not too trivial to point out that welfare policies are not only a means to, um, to, to achieve distributional justice, but they also help to stabilize uh, political systems by reducing those inequalities that lead to at least some people um, demanding more protectionist and uh, less liberal uh, policy agendas. And a good example uh, is, uh, I think, um, a paper by uh, Glitch, which uses data and methodology by Colantono and Starnik. Colantono and Starnik have a paper where they show that um, increasing import competition uh, increases uh, support for right-wing populist in structurally declining regions in 15 European countries. And Klitsch very simple decomposes this effect according to the welfare state generosity in different countries. And he shows that the effect is very much centers, centered on countries with weak uh, welfare states, very much in line with uh, work by uh, Roderick. And on uh, countries that in principle have uh, uh, have generous welfare state provisions, but cut down benefits very much in line with the excellent work by Timo who shows uh, how, uh, the, uh, how, how welfare cuts contributed to the Brexit uh, vote in, in uh, the UK. So to summarize this, welfare state policies help on, and welfare institutions help to cushion this effect. But I think we have to accept that 
the challenge is not to just compensate losers for some income losses. Those people who are affected lose much more than just income. They lose development perspectives. You cannot easily compensate for the loss of this development perspective. This all made perhaps some sense when sectoral mobility and regional mobility was higher. And uh, you could assume that people who are adversely affected by some economic shocks might then find a different job, a better job, some five or six years later. But uh, those who are affected find it increasingly difficult to uh, uh, indeed uh, make their own living and and um, and uh, create a livelihood for uh, themselves. And um, there's a lot of survey evidence about what people are concerned about. It is the economic situation for sure, but it's very often much more the loss of a development perspective. And I think this has to be put more in the focus of uh, policies that want to to mitigate these adverse effects. It's not about compensating losers. It's really about uh, generating new development perspectives for individuals and for regions. Um, there's quite some research papers who have tried to identify the economic mechanisms that translate economic shocks into um, populist voting. And it has turned out that labor market adjustments are a main driver of this whole uh, development. So labor market policies certainly may help to also um, decrease uh, populism. But many labor market policies or many current labor market policies are very much concentrated on avoiding unemployment. And this makes sense. Unemployment is, well, it, unemployment has for a long time been a driver of um, of just not turning out in elections at all, also of unemployed people who, who just abstain from voting and populists have been successful in uh, mobilizing uh, there. But much more than unemployed individuals, it is people who are in employment, but either fear losing their job in the future due to ongoing globalization, due to technological change that support populists, and uh, people who just don't uh, see potential for upward mobility anymore. And uh, this is to say that labor market policies may help, but they must focus more on uh, improve this upward mobility of people. This is, of course, always easy said, and uh, one uh, could uh, discuss a couple of concrete ideas uh, here, what to do uh, concretely, but in the end, uh, there must be a stronger focus on qualifying and on training those people on the job uh, that lose out due to skill bias, not only in technological change, but in labor market uh, developments uh, more generally to participate in this job upgrading that is going on. So there's also people who benefit a lot from these um, developments and who are also less likely to support uh, policies. And it's not, not, uh, not an easy task. But uh, it is uh, also a task that needs the cooperation of uh, employers, but I think policy can incentivize uh, qualification and training measures. Uh, policy uh, can provide uh, infrastructure and uh, also uh, by uh, demand side uh, measures, uh, policy can uh, do more to, um, to, to incentivize uh, this training and qualification. Um, regional policies are important. We see that not only people who are directly negatively affected by um, labor market adjustments turn to support uh, turn to support populists. It's also people who just live in those regions that are hardly hit, although they have a good job and they earn a decent uh, income, that become susceptible to. Um, populist uh, uh, agenda. So the challenge is, uh, again, to provide development perspectives for those regions who are left behind uh, in this uh, development. A uh, concrete example, uh, there's, uh, I don't know if, if uh, everybody's familiar with this, uh, most people in Europe are, uh, there's uh, a large uh, policy regional development uh, policy program by the European Union, the European Regional Development Fund that supports uh, regions uh, who uh, earn less than 75% of GDP uh, per capita. And um, 
own research and research by Albanese show that this uh, program is not only um, successful in creating some development perspective, but also in mitigating uh, populist support. So the program is designed in a way that you have a clear cut off if you cut off if you earn less than 75% of um, the average EU uh, GDP per capita, you are uh, you're eligible for the program. And if you earn more, you're not eligible. This gives you a good opportunity to compare regions who are just a little bit richer than those who just received the funds. So you can compare regions that earn 80% uh, percent to those who earn 70%. Percent. And you can argue that this is that these regions are similarly poor in economic terms and that the allocation of funds is quasi-random. And what you see is that the, the recipient regions um, of, of these funds uh, are significantly less likely to vote for populist parties uh, in elections. So the policy uh, helps. It helps if you invest into uh, regions, not only to provide development perspectives, but also to counter populism. The challenge is that um, this old ideal of regional development uh, policies to 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 um, to allow for convergence for 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 poor people to catch up to the rich uh, regions um, is um, would not say it has failed, but uh, it has not very good consequences given this stark uh, inequalities between the development of urban centers and peripheral uh, regions. And uh, there's, there's an interesting uh, policy set um, summarized under this, this buzzword of a smart uh, specialization that, um, and uh, Thomas is looking at uh, the watch uh, smart specialization <laughs> that I only want to mention here, but not summarize. But uh, I think here's also similarly to, to the welfare uh, policies, one needs a shift in focus um, to, to to, to generate new trajectories according to the strength of the regions to help peripheral regions to participate in the success that urban regions have. They can probably not, not catch up, but if you are a region in the periphery of an urban region, invest into communication structure and digital infrastructure to allow people to um, live there, but work uh, virtually or in person in the urban center. If you are a remote region with a scenic landscape, invest into green tourism to give this, uh, this uh, region opportunity to grow endogenously, even if it cannot catch up just to provide a perspective is often more important for for people ten than uh, to to really have gdp income growth as long as they see that uh, there's there's a future for the region oh yeah um Migration is a big issue. It's not uh, not uh, easily addressed by economic policy. I just, uh, in the end, migration is the topic that unites all the right wing uh, populists. Um, um, and I think there's this, uh, the more important policies to tackle this uh, are migration and immigration policies. There's a scope for economic policy here if it comes to uh, countering distributional cons, uh, conflict, whether it's really there because low-skilled uh, individuals face labor market competition from immigrants that could then be addressed by the labor market policies, whether there is actual um, competition for scarce public goods like hospitals, like daycare, daycare facilities in school. If you have a lot of immigration, it's probably not, not a good idea to cut down public spending in these areas where people then uh, indeed face competition with migrants, which then makes them more susceptible for this anti-immigration rhetoric. But there's also, and this will then be in the paper, some opportunity for a smart uh, policy uh, design to at least mitigate the perception of this conflict, even if it is not actually there. But in the end, the migration thing is a migration topic is a big thing and it's complicated and it's one of the areas where uh, economics and culture most obviously strongly interact. Um, I only say one word to the supply side. So uh, if it is about policies to counter populism, all these policies before are mainly policies to, to counter 
um, dissatisfaction with the political system, whether it's then tapped or, or, or caught in by, by populist or somebody else, doesn't matter. The one thing that, that's really specific about populist or one thing that's really specific about populist is their success in political campaigning that uh, depends on also innovative approaches to uh, public communication, but, but potentially harmful approaches to political uh, communication that has transcended into the mainstream, specifically in the US. I mean, uh, if, if the US president stands there and tells in the midst of the pandemic blatant lies what you should, what you should do to, to, um, to, to, to fight the disease, inject bleach and stuff like that. I mean, it's crazy. And, uh, um, but, but, uh, but, it, but it, 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 it poisons this whole political debate. And uh, that's an aspect I would be very interested in discussing. Bidenomics is the one thing and the economic policies imposed are the one thing, but you have to bring the message across to the voter in the very end. So you have to convince the voter that you have a good policy that uh, helps uh, him uh, or her. And how Biden, if Biden has a strategy here to to, to uh, fight this, this uh, very specific uh, rhetoric, this fact ignoring uh, rhetoric, I think this is a big challenge for him and his administration. And uh, that's a big challenge for all the people who are engaged in public uh, debates. Uh, my inclusion are here in writing and you can read it by uh, yourself. I have uh, said what I wanted to, to say. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, um, Robert. Um, I, I taken uh, if, um, just one thing that I uh, remarked in, in what you said is I now understand why populists are against the EU when the EU apparently via his pro their programs uh, of uh, involuntarily or voluntarily fighting um, against populism. We have an excellent uh, panel, so we would immediately. Um, ask you to give your uh, comments. Catherine, uh, perhaps first, you are founder and director of Counterpoint, uh, an agency or whatever you call it, uh, who is uh, advising governments, business people on social and uh, on how to manage social and political risk. And that that's what we're talking about. So excellent to have you and please your comments. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Robert, for your paper, which uh, which I read with great pleasure. And, and I think that's the first thing that I'd like to say, which is that um, I'm now based in Paris, but I've just spent the past nearly 30 years in the UK. And so I was, in a sense, I had a front row seat, uh, if not actually a front row stage uh, on, on the Brexit, uh, on the Brexit lead up, but also the immediate aftermath of Brexit. And I think that one of the things that um, was most shocking about the way that uh, the Brexit result um, was looked at, and then, you know, the, the diagnosis of the causes was looked at, was trying to actually separate out uh, culture from, from economics. And it gave rise to an incredibly sterile debate. And people started talking about the left behind um, and um, trying to separate being left out culturally from the national conversation, from the national norms, from national values, from being left behind uh, economically. Um, and I'll, so it's, it's very good to, to, to be able to look at economics in a, in a different kind of way. Um, and I'll come back to this um, at the end of my comments, but you know, one comment that I think we need to, one thing we need to keep in mind is not just who are the left behind, quote unquote, uh, and why they feel this way, but actually who they imagine is leaving them behind. Because I think, uh, you know, this, this is in part what fuels uh, populism. It's, it's how you imagine that elite that is doing the leaving behind um, uh, of, of yourself or of your community. So I just want to uh, make just a three points um, that are essentially to address um, why I think you make great points about both the, cult, the, the economic dynamics that drive populism and populist supporters and populist party voters, uh, but also why it's so difficult um, for uh, economic, um, economic policies to actually succeed 
uh, encountering populism, even if the causes are, are driven by this. So I think the first thing that I would say is that while we have, uh, you know, while we're busy trying to say economics is not just income, it's also about culture um, and culture is socioeconomic, what the populists are very good at doing is actually separating culture and, and economics out just enough so that when a mainstream government or set of policymakers says, we're going to address jobs, um, populist parties are very good at saying, uh, that's fine, but you know, how are you going to address the change in our communities that we don't recognize? And when a mainstream uh, uh, government says, oh, well, we're, we're going to address immigration, um, populist parties are very good at saying, well, that's fine, but we need jobs. Um, so you know, they do that separating out, I think, quite effectively. The second thing that I wanted to say about uh, labor, uh, you know, labor reform, labor market reform in particular, is that not only does it take time, and we're going to see this, you know, in terms of the window of opportunity that Biden has between now and the midterm elections, right? This is going to be the making or breaking uh, of Bidenomics. But I think that one of the things about economic policy is that it is technocratic. It is necessarily technocratic. It's necessarily about expertise. Um, it's complicated calculations. It's taxonomies. It's benchmarking. It's means testing. It is everything that um, the populist parties instrumentalize against the mainstream and everything that populist party voters and supporters hate. It's this idea of a technocratic elite um, putting in place something which they see as both kind of technocratic and societal, as opposed to being sort of community or people led and organic. Um, and I think that, you know, this is one of the huge hurdles that policymakers have to overcome is that even the policies that would address so many of the dynamics or the grievances that are at the heart of populist, uh, of populist mobilization, um, they, they are very easy to caricature and experience as the kind of technocratic, non-political, non-emotional kind of politics that so many of these, um, of these citizens want. Just, just two quick points to conclude. One is that I think you you very large you you made the great point um, about inequality. I think you know it's not about uh, absolute income or where you sit absolutely um, on on a scale. It's really about inequality. And there's a couple of things about this. One is that I think that it's also a failure of education, right? You know that lack of an economic development perspective is also about how we view higher education, uh, apprenticeships, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that, that is one of, the, one of the policies that we need to take uh, very, very seriously, because as you point out, and also as Martin Sandbu points out in his, uh, you know, in his really good book, um, The Economics of Belonging, you know, it's, it's about that lack of capacity to adapt and that lack of capacity to adapt Yes, it's about technological change. Less it's a, yes, it's about labor market transformation and, and so on. Um, but it is also about you know, a failure to educate for the needs, uh, the needs of, of, of a future economy. But I have one comment and one question here. The question is, if labor market and more broadly economic policies are the key to this, and I do think that they are absolutely at the heart of this, then you know, why not vote for the left? Right? Why not vote for those who proposed economic uh, solutions once upon a time? Now, part of the answer to that is that uh, social democratic parties and socialist parties have themselves failed to, to adapt. But I think that the other thing here is that we shouldn't underestimate, um, again, going back to who is in power, the fact that this is also about a rejection of what is perceived as elite collusion, right? Um, elites that are failing to protect, but also who are really in it for themselves, elites who have usurped their power. And I think that this is, uh, you know, this is very important. And this is where populists are able to capitalize by simply saying we're not like them, right, regardless of what policies they put forth. And then I guess, you know, just to conclude, 
because this is something that I was very struck by when we did work on, you know, different communities, uh, specifically in, in, in England, but also in, in Scotland. Uh, but Scotland is a different is a different case, but specifically in England. One of the things that we kept saying to people was, you know, you do realize that this vote, particularly in communities that had supported Brexit, this vote will probably, the consequences are probably that it will make you poorer, right? That this, this will not improve either your socioeconomic status or your income, certainly not, you know, in, in the short term. And actually the answer that we got to that was we don't care, right? They really, we don't care. We don't care about being poor. And the second part of the answer was because we'll all be poorer together, right? So this goes back to this, you know, A, inequality, but also the imagined community here. Um, and the real, you know, the real resentment against um, not just the left or the right, but you know, a political class, those who usurped uh, either their wealth um, or their position. And I think it, you know, it's important to keep that in mind, that it's, it's not just about being better off or having better prospects. There's also something that has been changed in part by the communications that you were alluding to, Robert, a part, in part by the kind of media, both the new media, but also the old media. You know, let's not forget the work of the tabloids, you know, very traditional media. Uh, you know, in, in, in the UK, um, the work of the media in really creating a polarization and an emotionality that actually drives people to say things like, I don't care that I'm, I'll be poorer, you know, we'll all be poorer together, you know, which is where the notion of community and the people actually comes in and, and connects to, to, to populism. So I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We don't hear anything. I... Okay, yeah, okay, that's better. Uh, sorry, I would like to hand over to Dalia uh, Marin, who has already joined us um, in September, uh, talking about unification and the role that uh, Treuhand has played and, and structural policy have played in at that time. Uh, promoting sort of uh, populism and with some hope uh, that this uh, will turn to another side, to a positive side now. But now your comments, please, on, on Robert. Um, uh, I would like to share my slides. Okay, so um, my comments uh, uh, to this, uh, my contribution to this panel will focus on globalization and populism in Germany. So basically there are two reasons why globalization has no role to play for the rise of the right-wing party uh, in Germany, the AfD. And the two reasons are first, there is a wrong time pattern. And the second is that right-wing populism is mainly an East German phenomenon. So let me explore these two points. So two wrong time pattern. When you look at the openness of the German economy, you see that the openness is stagnating since the financial crisis. And this picture shows this. So what you see here is in, in, since in the periods between 1990 to 2008, the openness of the German economy was expanding fast. Um, uh, people have called the, this period, uh, the period of hyperglobalization. And this period of hyperglobalization ended in 2008 when there was this trade uh, collapse then there was the recovery of trade. And what you see in this table is since 2011, the openness of the German economy is stagnating. At the same time, when you look at the evolution of the Alternative für Deutschland, 
AfD, the right-wing populist party in Germany, you see that the AfD started to exist in 2013 as an anti-Euro and an anti-Greek bailout party. Only after 2015 became the AfD a xenophobic, anti-immigrant right-wing party. So what I'm arguing is that this time pattern, the rise of the AfD happened after 2015, while globalization is stagnating already since 2011, this speaks against the role of globalization uh, for the rise of the AfD in Germany. And now it come, I come to the AfD in, in East, that the AfD is an East German phenomenon. The, 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 the numbers I show in this slide it shows you the AfD's electoral share in, in, in the Neue Bundesländer in East Germany. So it's, it's between 23 and 27 percent, while in West Germany it takes five to 10 percent. So why is the AfD so strong in East Germany? Uh, that, for that, to, to, to get to an answer, we have to look at the political reforms after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So basically what you see is the reforms contain the liberalization of trade with the former DDR. Basically the tariffs fell from 100% to zero. At the same time, there was a currency reform in which the East German Ostmark was... Um, uh, was exchanged to the Deutschmark at, at, at the rate of one to one. Um, it, as a result of this currency reform, the East German wages rose to 70% of the West German level, even though productivity in the East was only 30% of the West. So as a result, the manufacturing sector immediately went bankrupt overnight. And as a result, we have the deindustrialization of East Germany. So after uh, 1989, when the economic convergence process started between East and West, um, it started in, in, in the first five years, there was a rapid uh, convergence, but with the demolition of, of uh, the Treuhand, uh, which privatized East German assets, um, the, this convergence process came to a halt. So basically the convergence process stopped uh, around 25 years ago. And at the same time, this uh, convergence process was accompanied by a false narrative. And this false narrative said that East Germany has nothing to sell to the world. But that was the safe so, so East Germans had very low self-esteem because they felt they had nothing to sell to, to in a market economy. But in fact, it was the currency reform that robbed the region of its cost advantage. So the economic conditions and the low self-esteem of the population in East Germany are the drivers of the IFD's success in East Germany. In this, globalization has no role to play. East Germany is a closed economy with little exposure to international trade and little exposure to immigrants. So there is a theory of intergroup contact, which was developed by sociologists and uh, psychologists, which argues that little interaction with foreigners supports xenophobic feelings. And in fact, the recent study for Germany indeed finds that more refugees in a given municipality correlate with fewer votes for the AfD in 2017. Now, let me come to the US. The China shock in the US, um, uh, the China shock in the US led to large job displacement and the important thing about it is, was that it was a displacement that was not spread uh, widely across the whole the United States. The sh China shock was particularly concentrated in particular regions and destroyed the entire ecosystem of that region. 
So in some of these regions, the job losses accounted for 8% of the total employment. Uh, and a, a recent study showed, in fact, that the China shock led to the victory of Donald Trump in the US. So why is it that Germany didn't suffer from the same fate? Uh, first of all, China shock was much smaller in Germany compared to the US. So in the US, the Chinese import share between 2000 and 2008 increased by 24 percentage points percentage points in, in the US, while in Germany in the increase by 14 percentage points in the, same, uh, in the same period. Moreover, the Chinese competition displayed imports from Southern Europe and Turkey and therefore hurt Southern Europe and Turkey, but didn't hurt Germany. And the last thing is that Germany had the opening up of Eastern Europe and that meant that uh, while the US, Eastern Europe did, doesn't play any role in, 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 in the United States as a, as a trade partner. So rising imports from China were more than compensated by rising export to China and to Eastern Europe. Uh, the, the rising export to China were extraordinary, but because the Chinese love the high quality German products. So what can we learn from, t from, from, from the, the East German and the US experience? Uh, we should provide a system programs to lower the trade adjustment cost of affected regions. So for instance, the Green Deal, which says it gives support to regions which exit coal is exactly the, is exactly the right measure to take. And the second measure is that you should try to establish new industries in dying regions. So in East Germany, the battery cell production for electric cars is an example of a successful uh, instrument to combat dying regions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dalia. Uh, excellent. I, I think this um, is uh, in, uh, quite a, in a line with what Robert has said in, on the perspectives. That would be perspectives for the Eastern German economy. Let's go to uh, overseas and first um, to Tom Ferguson from INET, uh, who has done a lot of research on populism and politics. Uh, and please um, give us some insights on the question if Bidenomics will be the blueprint of how to go against populism. There, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I guess I, these days under COVID, I always begin by saying it's a pleasure to be here because you know the chances of not being here in the last year were a eh, little too high for comfort. But uh, I'm glad that everybody else made it too, including quite, a, I can see quite a number of my friends around and including of course, Robert, who uh, works uh, in part under a grant from uh, my organization, the INET. Um, and I, I, I'm almost in a position to sort of do the Hubert Humphrey, the old democratic politician saying, I basically agree with everybody. I don't quite. But it, it really doesn't matter. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today. Let me just try to sort of set up the Biden story. Um, you know, it's the anniversary of George Floyd's death. Um, and actually, today comes the news that the infrastructure bipartisan talks uh, may actually be on the verge of collapse. Um, and then also some news that U.S. Uh, corporations are sitting on enormous piles of money already in their um, various campaign accounts. So they're getting ready to spend. This was after a number of them had all said they would perhaps not fund people, Republicans supporting uh, that insurrection on January the 6th. So there's a, a lot to think about here. Uh, and since I only got seven minutes, I think I'll just go straight uh, into the business um, here. Um, first of all, uh, how best to put it, there's not one, but a whole string of shocks that hit the US political system more or less all at once. And it, um, the campaign is only one of them. Start with what actually happened, which was 
that uh, Bernie Sanders lost the primary to Joe Biden. And he, it was basically over before COVID hit. But the big issue that Sanders spotlighted, which was medical care and the absence of you know, health insurance for everybody, immediately turned into really the biggest issue uh, for lots of people there was. Now, the government did a kind of barely bipartisan, they argued back and forth, the Republicans and the Democrats, but they did finally announce that, well, the government would pick up the cost for at least COVID testing. Um, it turns out that's not been honored and that lots of hospitals are still billing people. Now, um, my point is, is that it's a bad scene when, uh, in effect, if you like, the, the moral uh, impossibility of doing what uh, everybody sort of knows needs to be done so, sort of starts as the campaign goes on. I mean, this, this, it, it, that's a problem. Then when Biden won, uh, you have to pay attention to what actually, how he won. He won by way more than he needed to actually be sure the vote count was obviously okay. That's clear. Um, but the Democrats did not do nearly as well as they thought they would uh, in either the House or the Senate. Uh, you know, they finally, they got a 50-50 tie in the Senate in the January elections in Georgia. Uh, but they, their House majority, which I think are at the time of the election day, was probably around 10 or 11 votes count. It's, it's down to about seven now. It'll, it could drop a bit more too. Uh, but the point is what happened there? Now, one explanation, the most popular, because there were all kinds of people saying that the Democrats had a huge swing in money from business to them. That turns out not to be true. My colleagues and I published this. You can see the graph uh, on the INET website. Uh, that just the big surge of money for the Democrats just didn't materialize in the congressional races. It's, it's the usual, we've long shown that you get a linear model outcome. That is to say the percentage of votes, percentage of cash is quite, uh, between the two major parties are quite strongly correlated. And no, that is not because of some endogeneity in where the cash goes. We can show you that that's false too. Um, but, you know, so the, you got to think about this. Is there really, uh, would, how much of a majority is there for Biden um, at the, at least at the time of the uh, election, maybe narrow? What if you were looking at an odd outcome that COVID created? That's a scary prospect. It's scary because, yes, it's true. Anyone who followed the events in the United States at, on January 6th realizes uh, that's not politics as usual. Um, you could cite a few things before the Civil War as sort of predecessors, but basically nobody has really tried to overturn an election like that ever. Um, and uh, you've got to just deal with the fact, I, and I, I was very slow to jump to this. I never thought that uh, even the right-wing Republicans were really fascists, but the current crowd uh, that does the big lie that the election was stolen and just says this over and over and over. Um, it's, it's obvious that if, um, if they were to come back to power, they might well never allow themselves to be counted out again. Um, right now, the Republicans are going through state legislatures and trying to shift the way uh, votes get counted in the states in the appeals process, and they are, of course, making the traditional strong effort to uh, dampen down the vote. So th this is, you know, this better not fail, basically, uh, in the Biden effort. Now, what do we think of the Biden effort? First thing to be said is, you know, the, the relief program, when he went big for that, it's clear, I think, that, and it passed, um, on a narrow vote, but it passed. Um, that's clearly boosted his popularity, though it's not, if you look at it in historical perspective by folks say, you know, a couple hundred days out, it's not particularly high by historical standards. But yeah, it, the, 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 the going big for relief uh, was popular. Uh, and there is a kind of little glow now uh, around um, there. On the other hand, 
look slightly beneath that and you get a different perspective. I mean, one big problem is that every major business organization in the United States has rejected the Biden proposed tax program. I mean, he had one for the corporation income tax that was immediately rejected by everybody. And the um, camp and the uh, proposals to raise, for example, personal income taxes and a variety of others. We haven't got time to go into the details. Those are all uh, flatly rejected. Um, Moreover, um, if you look, say, at the Texas vote on the legislature's ability to get into votes, while all these corporations were saying uh, in the immediate aftermath of January 6th that, well, they wanted to be woke and were even signing protests uh, against um, pushing blacks out of the uh, voting universe again. Um, they didn't, most, many of them in Texas did not live up to that pledge. I think the article, you can just read it in the Wall Street Journal, actually. It's perfectly uh, straightforward, I think, uh, what's going on there. Now, beyond that, um, many of what you think would be the natural allies for Biden, pretty obviously in the labor movement, well, you know, the effort to organize uh, Amazon failed. Um, the minimum wage increase, which was um, hugely pushed by uh, labor, didn't pass. It's probably not going to happen. Um, and actually, it's quite striking that uh, Biden hasn't, they have not really put through any new uh, rules on occupational health and safety, which the U.S. badly needs. You know, more broadly, the Biden administration doesn't have a clear exit strategy for getting out of COVID. They have basically just relied on the God from a machine, the vaccine. But they're not going to hit herd immunity. Nobody has a, a, a vaccine for people under 12. Um, you can see in that there's some clear labor market disarray, sometimes just said to be coming from people don't want to work. That seems improbable. What you do have are many people are still staying home to take care of kids. And the whole daycare system, not just in the formal daycare, but how you park kids in schools, that's all broken uh, at the moment. Um, and it's not clear how they fix this, particularly with all these folks. I mean, in the revisions of the British analysis of school transmission, um, show you that people forgot to count all the folks who had asymptomatic COVID and passed it on to folks above them. And uh, it's pretty obvious that in the, in the fall in the US, not in the summer, because people go outside, at least in the North, and it dropped last summer, it'll drop again. You may face at least a weaker second wave because vaccination really does seem to work thus far. Um, but the Biden folks are just sitting there telling everybody to go back to school. This is made to order for trouble. Um, and the CDC, our Center for Disease Control is giving well, the nicest thing I can say is pretty strange guidance that's been heavily criticized uh, by lots of doctors. Add all this up, and the fact that uh, they are, in, a, in effect, they haven't got an infrastructure compromise, and they don't have uh, much progress on the, um, I think it's called the American Families Act, uh, Speak, think of it as the social capital bill, uh, if you like. Um, could this fail? Yeah, it might. And of course, the terrible shadow is uh, in 2000, um, uh, sorry, in 1994 and in 2010, the first term after a first election cycle after a Democratic president got elected, the Democrats were cream both times. Now, Biden did the right move, which was to do something big enough to make a difference in people. But if nothing else happens, I mean, I, here I have to say that I think the discussion today was a bit superficial in that the fundamental problems, not just in the U.S., which is kind of always a funhouse mirror of what Europe uh, is really going through, too. I mean, we just do it on a colossal scale and worse, uh, generally. The fundamental problem is that, you know, we're, it's, as our sort of INET work in the dual economy, uh, has sort of stressed, Peter Temin, Service Storm, lots of other folks now. Um, you used to move people from the countryside into the city uh, and where they take higher productivity jobs. Now we're running that stuff in reverse. Huge amounts of people uh, just get, uh, can only find low wage work 
And people are building business models based on that. And in the U.S., since you have such weak social protections, that's a real horror show. Um, and the problem is not you can't just go back to normalcy. Uh, if you try that in the United States, you'll see another cycle of populism. Uh, I mean, that's the problem, not simply imports or something like imports were certainly part of that process. But this uh, reverse W. Arthur Lewis process, as Lance Taylor called it in his book, another INA thing, that's, that's the essence of this problem. And it's, you know, we, the jury is out on whether Biden can solve it. I hope he does, uh, because if he doesn't, um, who knows? Thank you, Tom. Um, we're a little running out of time uh, and we have a very important comment from Timo. Um, you've done an excellent paper some years ago already on Brexit, establishing a very clear link between the regions that have uh, suffered from uh, structural problems and then uh, the austerity shock uh, in 2010. Uh, so the mix of both seems to have uh, very clearly uh, explained uh, where Brexit has been uh, voted for. What are the lessons you take out of this when it comes to policy measures? And is there something already done in the UK? Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this. Let me just pick it up. Obviously, I have a particular interest in austerity um, as a topic. Um, and uh, Robert did an excellent job at summarizing uh, you know, a lot of this work that is going on. Uh, and what we see in the UK is that you know, places and people who have been hit by austerity were increasingly more likely to vote for and support essentially populist agendas where Brexit is obviously one of the incarnation of that populist agenda. But that was just activating existing grievances which uh, have been highlighted in particular by uh, Robert's excellent uh, sort of review, uh, which suggests that actually a lot of the structural issues were there um, and the welfare state was so to say the band-aid to uh, patch uh, uh, that was then sort of, uh, you know, violently removed, which sort of enabled this backlash to follow out. Um, at some level, this highlights obviously the importance for, uh, uh, you know, state interventions. Um, but I think in terms of the, you know, populism as a phenomenon more broadly, uh, we have to think about the supply side as well as the demand side. Um, a lot of the focus has been on the demand side in this uh, discussion, which is, you know, what are the origins and the economic drivers and so on um, that lead to uh, sort of broader popular support for populist agendas. Um, but I think the big structural issue that we face and that, that I think actually uh, uh, Robert mentioned towards the end is uh, to what extent we can actually actually tackle the supply side issues. Um, you know, Bidenomics is in that sense, you know, very good economic policy. Let's see how much gets through uh, uh, um, in terms of actual uh, policy outcomes. Um, but uh, it actually fails to tackle some of the supply side issues that, that I would, would, would say uh, uh, matter a lot. And this goes to the heart of questions around does representative democracy you know still work in the way that it was designed with the underlying checks and balances in place where obviously the media plays a very vital role in the process of transmitting information about the effectiveness of policy making intervention uh, um, when nowadays through social media and the uh, uh, sort of particularly in the US the overly politicization uh, of the media landscape narrows the ability for media sort of to you know, effectively, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide and shine a light on policy successes and policy failures, which obviously led, lead to, uh, uh, you know, you know, a significant risk um, that the media itself becomes a vector of entrenching political power, um, which in the UK, I think is quite evident in the US to some extent, it's also quite, you know, there's a lot of uh, evidence that suggests that this is happening. Um, and all of this happens in the context of um, the technological transformation in the media landscape um, that changes not just what is being reported on, how things are being reported on, how people consume news, but also who becomes a content generator, uh, which I think becomes very important uh, to, to, to understand going forward. And I think there's a lot of more you know, research work needed uh, um, in a day and age where uh, at the end of the day, social media is you know, uh, uh, sort of supporting essentially the idea of a narcissist entering, you know, in the media landscape, and many people, you know, uh, 
cannot really make a living uh, as sort of a content generator in traditional media anymore. Um, that sort of has a deep structural hollowing out issue um, that I think uh, is very important. Um, so we have the media, then we have politics as well. Who can afford to become a politician? Um, which in the US is a very important question uh, uh, whereby politics has become less responsive to actually incorporate, you know, broader parts of society, in particular also because of the erosion and uh, the democratic deficits that sort of, you know, start at the very bottom up at local political uh, uh, levels, uh, um, and obviously will find its way to the national level. And I think the, the third bit that uh, I think is very important to mention as well is, and this is where austerity again plays in, uh, uh, austerity had a, and will have a very long lingering effects, even though now there's an effective turn towards uh, you know, more expansive fiscal policy also in Europe, uh, you know, which you know, is very welcome, um, but it will linger because it, de facto it led to the erosion of the state's ability to actually deliver in an effective way. Through hiring freezes, it meant that ultimately there was an aging of the civil service um, that is not up to speed when it comes to new means, new technology. And there was a very limited training, which in some sense became very apparent in the pandemic, especially in Germany, whereby, you know, we're fighting, uh, you know, a pandemic with, uh, you know, 20th century, uh, in the 21st century with 20th century pen and paper tools and fax machines. So I think, uh, um, you know, but the legacy in my view is, 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 uh, that austerity has sort of led to this erosion of the state's ability to deliver. And there, I think I see a huge missed opportunity to actually, uh, uh, you know, think about repositioning the state, you know, and its role towards citizens, uh, um, because it actually uh, could have really done uh, good for evidence-based policy making, uh, bringing, uh, bringing in, uh, you know, shaping, a shine, a sh you know, shining a light on the importance of experts and expertise for for uh, you know uh, policy making, um, and uh, at some level, um, you know our policy making and policy response was quite poor in many instances, um, and I think that is the danger that we now see ourselves in, where there's a missed opportunity, and it obviously does shape uh, uh, potentially uh, you know give rise to views about uh, you know how China and other countries might have handled it much better, but obviously without the consensus being that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're supposed to be, you know, we're living in a liberal democracy uh, with freedom of expression and, uh, uh, you know, a sort of broad representation of uh, society through uh, its political channels. So I think this is for me the most important issue that Bidenomics uh, and sort of the policy response really needs to start thinking about how the supply side uh, uh, routes to populism can be tackled because there's only so much that can be done uh, um, um, on the demand side by sort of reasserting the welfare state by uh, making sure that uh, uh, you know uh, taxes actually do produce public goods um, benefiting broad society. So I, I think the the supply side is really what uh, is the big puzzle for for us all and uh, what we all need to kind of focus our attention to uh, um, um, in terms of our work and and what we do. Thanks. Thank you, Timo. Um, we are a little lucky because Joe Kesa is not yet completely there, um, but uh, we just have some minutes left, unfortunately. Uh, Robert, uh, would you uh, answer to one of these comments? Or... Yeah, these are uh, all, all excellent uh, remarks. And uh, should I pick up one? I just can, uh, I want to, to stress again that I agree a lot with uh, Timo on this uh, last uh, point. So, um, what's what's really novel about populism as compared to just fringe policy demand or dissatisfaction with elites or so is uh, exactly um, this this uh, populist rhetorics and uh, the ability to introduce lies into an an, an advanced political debate and uh, that's that's a poison i mean in the end all good decisions depend on the quality of information decisions are based upon and if this has success in the long run that not fact and figures matter anymore for deciding about policy options but opinions and beliefs and the will of the people whatever that is 
Uh, that's a huge threat for uh, the, the model of the liberal democracy and of the free market uh, economy. And um, when we talk about policy challenges, I would agree that uh, this is currently the major challenge. Mm 